Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think we still have some attendees um, that are trickling in, but uh, I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time. And I want to go ahead and get started because we've got an awesome program um, ready for you guys. So um, I'm Kavita Mahoney. I am the manager of the Garfield Park Arts Center, which is part of Indy Parks and the city of Indianapolis. So the Garfield Park Arts Center strives to inspire and build a community of arts learners, leaders, and organizations. We offer art classes, monthly exhibitions, concerts, events, and more. I strongly encourage all of you to come out and visit us. We're located right in the center of historic Garfield Park. You can also sign up for our newsletter through our website and follow us on social media. I'd like to welcome you to our evening program, Indie Parks Throughout the Years, a first Friday speaker program. This event is part of the 2020 Spirit in Place Festival themed Origins. Spirit in Place is supported by Lilly Endowment, Allen Whitehill Clues Charitable Foundation, Olson Group, the IU School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI, the Indianapolis Foundation, a CICF affiliate. We also encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag SBIndy, and feel free to tag the Garfield Park Arts Center as well as Spirit in Place in your post. We'll go ahead and deposit some of these um, hashtags and links in the chat as well. Our event tonight is supported by the Friends of Garfield Park and Indy Parks in partnership with the Indiana Historical Society. We're also proud to announce that this program is also an officially endorsed Bicentennial Community Project. Our event tonight marks the opening reception of our virtual exhibition, Indy Parks Throughout the Years, which is viewable on our website, gpacarts.org. The exhibit celebrates our bicentennial by sharing the history of our Indy Parks through historical narratives and images. Learn more about how our green spaces have created a space for civic pride, community, and culture across Indianapolis over the years. In alignment with Spirit in Place, we would like to acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional homelands of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and other indigenous communities, people who are unjustly removed from this land. Our origin story as a community begins with them. Before I introduce our first speaker, a quick reminder that attendees are encouraged to use our Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit questions for the panelists. Towards the end of this program, we'll actually have an opportunity for panelists to answer all of your questions. Lastly, we'd appreciate your input on this and other Spirit in Place programs by completing a survey at spiritinplace.org. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our first speaker. I'd like to introduce Glory June Grace, a public historian, writer, and preservation activist based in Indianapolis. A native of Hudson Lake in Northern Indiana, Grace earned a Bachelor of Science in Radio Television and English from Butler University and worked several years on air and radio. She holds a master's degree in public history from Indiana University and was a Chancellor Scholar. She is also a professional narrator and a performer of song and story. Her several areas of interest and research include the work of the New Deal, historic architecture, public sculpture, transportation corridors, parks, and an environmental history on which she has written numerous articles, papers, and studies. She's also a published author and editor of several books about local history and our parks. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Glory June. <laughs> this is my maiden voyage, friends, so be kind. Um, yeah, well, I'm a public historian, and one of the things I learned in grad school was context. What is the context? And when you think about a context, it's all about origin. So that fits in the theme very well. Where do our parks come from? Well, all parks have a few things in common. That is, they are land laid aside for public recreation. And that's a term that has evolved over the years a great deal. All parks have at their root a sense of real or impending loss. Uh, the loss of contact with nature, which of course has come around to be extremely important to us. At, at this time. Concepts of parks and recreation are woven from three basic threads really, or movements, and some others as well. The first would be the growth of cities that led to urban parks such as Garfield, 
and designed within what and they were designed within what might one might call the natural garden or pastoral movement that was going on in the late 19th century. The conservation movement, uh, almost simultaneous with that, was the idea of reserving or preserving, as the case may be, so-called unspoiled land. Um, this was also considered, scenery was considered a resource. And three, the outdoor recreation movement, uh, social benefits of the outdoors, physical, mental, moral value of contact with nature and the outdoors. So the origins of public parks, more or less as we know them, lie in the 19th century essentially, although uh, commons, greens, and squares were very common in, uh, in New England towns. They were utilitarian at first. You could pasture your cow there, for instance. Uh, but later they became places of recreation. Philadelphia was actually laid out with squares set aside for ornamental gardens. So this was a, an aesthetic use of those squares. Also, the idea of European pleasure gardens had emigrated to some cities in the mid-Atlantic states by the end of the first half of the 19th century. Um, in addition to amusements, uh, sweet stands, taverns, uh, they also featured formal gardens and curving walks so people could commune with nature. But these were really more the forerunner of what we consider amusement parks today. So in the same realm, we may note that in the 1890s, the interurbans often aided or created amusement parks. Um, one, for example, was uh, Fairview Park in, uh, the, the, on the north side of Indianapolis, which is now the campus of Butler University. Uh, in the mid-19th century also came a movement for planned landscapes. This started with cemeteries with a pastoral, slightly wild theme with hills and hollows and lakes and curving walks and drives. Cemeteries often served recreational purposes as well because people came to picnic with their loved ones and then they went on to uh, do other things sometimes in the cemeteries. Uh, Crown Hill, in fact, began from what had been a very popular picnic spot outside of Indianapolis called Strawberry Hill. And it was acquired in the 1860s for cemetery purposes. With the growth of, of industry in the mid 19th century, cities were growing in size and those open spaces were beginning to disappear. And that led to a need and indeed a demand for um, open spaces and places where inhabitants could touch the country, the rural spaces were becoming less accessible. Central Park created, be, begun I should say in, in 1853 was the first of these, the most famous probably, Frederick Law Olmsted and, and Calvert Vaux. Uh, this was a romanticized concept of nature, pastoral, and it was intended as, as he put it, as, as uh, Olmsted put it, immunity from urban conditions, which we so need I think sometimes. In the 1870s, Olmsted and Vox also created plans for Chicago's Jackson Park, Washington Park, some of the, and, and led on to other cities. Some of these parks featured more formal gardens and malls and promenades and so on. And 19th and early 20th century parks often included beautifully designed buildings. Uh, many of them were classical, which was considered to be inspirational look up on high, or they were of a fantasy romantic nature. And this might might be the, um, the pagoda in Garfield Park is a good example of that. Later landscape designers such as Jens Jensen, uh, particularly in Chicago, sought to recreate natural landscapes using native plants. And now we are seeing certainly a comeback of that today. In any case, most early city parks were intended mainly for passive pleasure, strolling, picnicking, canoeing in the lagoons, communing with nature. Uh, not so much the active pursuits, although some of the early parks did have some open spaces set aside where groups might play games or assemble. But by the end of the 19th century, most cities of any size had begun to establish parks. Um, they hired parks planners even, such as George Kessler, whose name is associated with Garfield. Certainly he planned a system of parks and boulevards in Indianapolis. Another development of the 19th century in the first decades after the Civil War was the conservation movement. And that concerned itself with a variety of issues involving uh, forests and fish and wildlife and water and, and wilderness and in fact, scenery. So a 
sense of impending and actual loss impelled the conservationists of the 19th century. Majority of these were, of course, from that rapidly urbanizing eastern portion of the United States. Progressive era dawned in the 1890s. There was a, a cry for government reform, that sounds familiar, and a flurry of social activism and public spirit as this characterized the next two and a half decades. The conservation movement took on a professional dimension with uh, emphasis on efficient utilization based on scientific principles. And the progressive era also spawned related movements for organized recreation, some of which blended social welfare with public parks. A greater percentage of the population was living in cities far from what was widely perceived as the benign influence of nature. So an increasing number of people realized the need for places of play for both children and adults. Again, there were some earlier related efforts, post-Civil War fresh air camps touted the benefits of rural unspoiled spaces to children trapped in cities. The obvious limitations and logistical nightmares of this movement, uh, although it did continue, in part led to the playground movement. That began in Boston in the 1880s, but the model developed in Chicago around Jane Addams and her Hull House. This was in the early 1890s and that led in turn isn't history wonderful, to several small inner city playgrounds in Chicago by 1912, and indeed everywhere. For example, statewide here in Indiana, there was a playground movement in cities large and small, and that was promoted by the Indiana Federation of Women's Clubs. So beyond the playground movement, the benefits of uh, recreation were not limited to children. After the turn of the century came the beginnings of a recreation movement a growth of participatory sports. There were uh, problems with the passive parks that were not set up for these active sports. Natural areas were being worn and ruined, but alternatively, areas for active sports were not often and designed attractively. So in the early 1900s, uh, and this started in Chicago's South Park District, there were model recreational facilities being developed in called small parks. And they often included the very new concept of the field house. And this allowed for recreation year round and for other activities, drama, music, art, and in fact, the art center in Garfield Park. These were not previously seen in parks as well as community involvement, meeting spaces for community groups and clubs and classes. In the cities, the boom in construction of public recreational facilities in the 1920s came to full fruition in the 1930s. You knew I was going to get into this under the New Deal programs such as the WPA. In urban parks, it was primarily WPA, sometimes the NYA, the National Youth Administration, that constructed uh, community centers, band shells, swimming pools, golf courses, tennis courts, athletic fields. And in smaller towns, often these New Deal developed facilities were the first ones that that particular town would ever have for public use. So I've now given you a historic context. And needless to say, there have been changes, so many changes and increases in public demand in the decades since World War II. And they've had a profound effect on the historic resources that I vaguely mentioned. I'm in recreational land of all types. But remember, parks have ever been, as Richard Lieber, the father of Indiana State Park said, Havens for our errant searching souls. Thank you so much, Gloria June, for providing us with um, that history and kind of context of uh, parks in the United States. I think that's really helpful um, as we get ready to jump into our next speaker, who is Jordan Ryan. Um, Jordan Ryan is the architectural archivist that coordinates the Indianapolis Bicentennial Collecting Initiative for the Indiana Historical Society Archives and Library. They have a master's degree in public history from IUPUI and a bachelor's degree in art history from Heron School of Art and Design. Their scholarship revolves around the urban built environment, historic preservation, redlining, highway displacement, postal architecture, and LGBTQ historic sites. You can also follow them on Twitter at Jordan Ryan Arch. I'll go ahead and toss it over to Jordan. Thanks so much. And thanks, Glory June. I could listen to you talk all day. Your voice is so calming. I'm gonna share my screen, a few slides. 
How does that look? All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of contemporary issues around land use and around parks and uh, sort of how I, as an architectural archivist, I, I tend to use the archives to tease out these historic nuances and these changes over time um, to look at contemporary challenges. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about historic parks and their founding and sort of the land use changes and policies surrounding them. So what does Indianapolis look like before Kessler's 1909 Park and Boulevard plan? So here I'm fully acknowledging that I'm beginning with the city's history and that of white settler squatters, um, those concepts of city planning rather than that of the Miami and Delaware tribes that previously appreciated the land. So here on the slide, I have the 1820 mile square plan for Indianapolis and also an illustration of Washington Street in 1825, um, which I think is a really interesting visual to, to help you kind of imagine what downtown or what we think of as downtown, what it looked like in 1825. Just a few decades later, um, here we have some bird's eye illustrations from 1854 and 1864. Uh, think about if you were on the top floor of the public library um, central branch looking south towards Monument Circle, that's sort of the view here. And as you can see from 1854 and just a decade later, um, we're seeing that expansion. We're seeing it sort of piecemeal in all directions, but certainly there's less green space. There's more structures. There's taller structures. Um, so population is continuing to grow. And as that growth continues, there's expansion. As uh, Gloria June mentioned before, uh, a little bit about the City Beautiful movement. I think that sort of 1890s to 1900s um, strategy, this movement as sort of a reaction to population increases and to, you know, city boundary expansions, that density that we're seeing and experiencing in larger U.S. cities, um, that all plays a role, you know, prior to the Kessler plan. Um, it's part of a larger progressive movement where social reform, um, where we're really starting to see sort of this discussion about quality of life issues in some ways, particularly for lower income and, and city dwelling residents. Um, we have people like urban planners and architects, landscape architects are thinking about things like housing and civic centers and infrastructure, pollution, parks, you know, amenities like that. But you can also see from this slide, um, thinking about how the city boundaries are expanding as the population is essentially doubling um, for some of these jumps. And we have, we have a very large expansion of um, city property. So that brings us to the Kessler plan. Um, so Georgie Kessler, you know, this landscape architect who is selected to develop our park and boulevard system here in Indianapolis, he comes in, this plan is approved in 1909, and it really engages with natural features on all sides of town. You know, we've got White River, Fall Creek, um, Central Canal, Pleasant Run, uh, Pogues Run, which is now, you know, moved partially underground, but it's, it's still represented on the map here. Um, you know, this plan includes about 3,400 acres of parkland. You know, there's six major bridges. Um, there's some really unique and site-specific features for these major parks. So here I've mapped some of the, the parks that are actually highlighted um, with, I've labeled them as kind of messy, but you can see um, he's incorporating parks that were already sort of in existence. And then there's some new parks that are brought in for this plan. Um, I have a few of them marked at the bottom here, like Greenlawn Cemetery, obviously removed. And then we have another one that gets removed later. Uh, but there's quite a lot of assets here that he's sort of balancing and incorporating into the plan, right? So keep in mind those, those pesky boundaries I mentioned for 1909. We do see the significant jump from 1910 to 1925, particularly on the north and east sides of town. So like, how is that reflected in the post Kessler Park history, right? So I do wanna mention, I do think this is kind of interesting. So the blue line here is sort of the boundary of the Kessler plan, but you can see there's three new parks that sort of come into being post Kessler and that's Eagle Creek, Holiday and Broader Bowl. But then there's also the addition of two new parks um, right after the Kessler plan, you know, a decade later, we get the Frederick, Frederick Douglass Park. And then um, in the 90s, we have sort of the, the Kennedy King um, 
land reconfiguration where we get MLK Memorial Park. And then just, just to give you some context to today, here's a 2016 map of, of all of the, the current parks. There's like 360 parks, conservation areas, and gardens. So what's this bringing us to? Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of redlining and, and land use and sort of what happens post Kessler, you know, what they couldn't have predicted just a few decades later. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about redlining. So what is redlining? It's the discriminatory practice by which banks and mortgage lenders and insurance companies um, within a specific area kind of refuse or limit loans. Um, this tends to be to older and inner city neighborhoods, um, particularly to non-white and or low income families. And this is by the guidance of the Federal Housing Administration's Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1937. So in addition to that, you know, realtors and real estate developers misrepresent markets and discriminate against prospective home buyers in order to control market values. So the key to reading this map is that um, they're, they're, valuing, they're putting a value statement on different parcels, on different tracks, right? Green is the best, blue is still desirable, yellow is definitely declining, and red is hazardous. So hence the name redlining. Um, redlining has created cultural and financial dynamics that favor white home buyers while creating an adverse effect for racially oppressed people, particularly black communities. Some reasons that the HLC devalued areas um, tended to be because of the type of resident that had to do with race, nationality, immigration status, um, also the structures themselves. So the type of housing, the age, um, the material of the house, and then things like market values, assessment trends, even proximity to industry and floodplains. So here I've overlaid the Kessler plan with the redlining map. And I, th I think it's interesting to see that almost all of the waterways are now in the devalued red and yellow areas. And most of the parks are also in the devalued red and yellow areas, um, which leads to, so what, what kind of leads to this happening just a few decades later? Um, you know, I'm thinking about changes in land use as we are growing as a city, as we're suburbanizing, right? Um, things like automobile culture, um, things like white flight. And as we leave Center Township, you know, we have a concentration of, of racial and low income um, of these, these neighborhoods with less political agency to sort of advocate for themselves. And this land use, um, I see it as sort of a, a devaluation to be redeveloped and is redlining sort of the first step in what becomes, you know, displacement and gentrification in this in center township. So it's sort of where my thoughts go. So then I mapped each of the individual parks on the redlining map. So here I'm taking those parks and the stars correspond with the redlining map, try to visualize that. Um, so as you can see, almost all of the individual kind of assets are either redlined or you know devalued within the, the yellow areas. Um, there's a few blue. There's one in Irvington, and then there's one in Garfield Park, um, which you know I I would argue they maintain more of a steady working class white identity, and I think that has a lot to do with it. So then after redlining comes urban renewal policy, right? Um, so federal policies that really take off in the 1930s. You know we have aged parts of the city. It's, you know, the city's overcrowded, the housing stock is starting to age, maybe a lot of housing. Um, we don't think about it now because we have this strict preservation movement, but back then I think there were kind of feelings that houses and buildings had a shelf life and maybe you demolish things and, and build new. And we hear a lot about slum clearance at this time when we're thinking about urban renewal. You know, in some cases municipal authorities are, are operating sort of some clearance. Um, so here we have um, six areas of town that are selected for urban renewal projects. And I think it's interesting out of the six, you know, three are clustered really closely together on the Northwest side. And you can see two of our park systems within, you know, a mile of that. And then we have three other um, clusters sort of on the Northeast side. They're a little bit more spread out but they both have parks pretty close to them too. And so I'm thinking, you know, is this 
what is this sort of trend and and why is everything so you know adjacent to each other and what does that mean um, because certainly the sites that are selected for urban renewal five of the six are previously redlined and one of them is you know devalued in in the yellow area so building off that i start thinking about you know downtown highway planning and you know after urban renewal you know the next policy that really kind of changes and it has a negative impact in some ways on the downtown is, is the 6570 inner loop. So thinking about the Federal Highway Act of 1956 and particularly the inner loop highway system, you know, I see it as pretty detrimental because it, it bisects neighborhoods, it cuts neighborhoods off of downtown. Um, you know, some report that 20,000 buildings were demolished and over 22,000 residents were displaced. Um, there's certainly you know, a decrease in connectivity and um, economic development because of this. So we have numerous parks that are on or adjacent to the final highway route. And I wonder, you know, my question is, was it less barriers to acquire that land, you know, or less review for the projects um, if you're acquiring city land to, you know, do these highways? Or is, um, you know, how much is that land use sort of valuation at play? And then we have an interesting trajectory on the southeast side. People usually get pretty shocked when I show them this. So one of the first um, plans for 6570, um, NDOT was just going to bisect through Garfield Park. So just cut the, the eastern part of it off. So I've shown that with that orange circle. Um, you can see one of, the, one of the plans. And then I have a little um, snippet from the report about Sort of this debate about just cutting through Garfield Park and you know certainly we're happy that they didn't do that. So bringing us to today and thinking about challenges we have with development and gentrification and displacement um, you know some people leave because they can afford to others can't you know others stay and thinking about disinvestment and you know policies that create low land values that it then becomes tempting to invest eventually you know, how is how does gentrification play a role in um, what seems like an inevitable last step from what started with redlining? And I define gentrification as the restoration or redevelopment of homes, businesses, and other amenities, um, usually accompanied by an influx of middle class or affluent people that result in displacing low income residents and changing the character of the neighborhood. And this is um, savvy data overlaid. Um, this is a map of of the uh, 2016 gentrified areas, according to Savvy. I did the same thing with evictions, um, just to see what sort of contemporary policies might, might play a role. Um, so the bigger dots are areas that have more evictions right now. We are coming up on a foreclosure and eviction crisis. Um, and again, a lot of the big dots sort of correspond um, to where these, these areas are, the parks. And then this is, Kind of a hard map to see, but this is the 2017 um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of, of 2017 to show the opportunity zones. And again, almost every single park is um, located in one of the opportunity zone tracks. Um, so these are areas that the federal government says needs more investment. And then even thinking about environmental justice and health, um, here's a map overlaying the Kessler plan with the current um, tree canopy. So the lighter the track, the less the trees, the greener, more trees. Um, so thinking about obviously, you know, away from the city center, you're gonna see more trees, but um, thinking about how that fits in with sort of the redlining map. And it starts to make me think about um, land value and sort of that um, systemic devaluation of land over time. So in conclusion, um, you know, so what? None of this data is particularly unique. This is happening in all major US cities. Um, now that we've sort of inherited this mess, it's up to us to kind of figure out how to fix it. Um, but I think it's fascinating to think about how Kessler and um, the parks commissioners and everyone, you know, they had no idea. They set out with the best of intentions. You know, the city was smaller, there were less people, there were very different circumstances. And they couldn't have predicted what federal, state, and city policies would come 30 years later and even other policies after that. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do on this issue and a lot of scholarship. Here are a few places to get started and I can share the links um, afterwards, but just something to think about as we move forward. 
you know, how will you think about space differently? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. I always find um, redlining to be a very interesting topic um, and have seen some of these maps previously and it definitely makes you think about um, who and how our parks are used and how they're evolving over time for sure. Um, I'll go ahead and um, keep us moving along for the sake of time and we'll introduce our next speaker. Um, Mark Fowle is the, executive, is the former executive director of the Friends of Garfield Park. Mark has established himself as a leader in sales management, business development, and organization, organizational capacity building. He has served in various capacities in the fields of sales, construction, workforce development, philanthropy, and municipal slash state government. He is the president and owner of DMB Marketing and Management. DMB is a strategic solutions company and has worked with over 40 corporations and not-for-profit partners. And most recently, after 20 years, the retired executive director of the Friends of Garfield Park. So Mark can talk a little bit more about um, friends groups in the parks and um, and a little bit more about Garfield. So I'll go ahead and throw it over to him. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Kavitha, and thank you, uh, everyone, for taking the time out uh, to be with us this evening. Um, I'm here to talk about a park that uh, I grew up in, in the neighborhood just to the south, in a place that uh, for almost 50 years, uh, my folks, we moved uh, into the Garfield Park area in, in 1971. Uh, so it has been uh, kind of just, it's it's my life. And um, Keith asked me to, to focus on some of the history, which is very unique uh, with respect to uh, Garfield Park. You heard about Kessler and you heard about a lot of the, uh, the growth that's happened uh, around the city. Uh, but specifically, I, uh, some of the facts that uh, are interesting to share. In 1871, Garfield Park was originally called Brad, Bradley Woods. It was purchased by the Indianapolis Fair Association, uh, who had plans to build a horse track there. Uh, but uh, the track was, was built, but in the collapse, uh, economic collapse of 1873, uh, the, um, the track failed. So in 1873, the city purchased uh, the plot of land uh, that was called Southern Park, and uh, some initial activity and growth happened there and um, until 1881 when President Garfield uh, was assassinated, the park was named in honor of President Garfield. Uh, through the period of time there, the original uh, pagoda was built, uh, there were ball fields and picnic shelters, and the park began as we heard about uh, the, uh, this uh, park movement across the country. Um, many things happened there. It was when Kessler showed up in, uh, in uh, 19, actually in 1906, uh, he was hired by the city and his plan was completed in nine, as we heard. Uh, but moving back, uh, the existing shelter that's there today, inter interesting of note, uh, was built in 1902. A local a community member, uh, Daniel Dupree, uh, did the design. A lot of growth started happening in 1895 around the park. What was interesting about the park at that time uh, why you see so much of the city of Indianapolis growth to the north uh, were the railroad tracks. And uh, the railroad tracks, multiple, I mean, were the crossroads of America, not because of our highways, but because of all the multiple uh, railroad lines that came into the city. So not much down south. The, uh, there were growing gardens, the city dump was south, and then there was a trolley uh, that led you down uh, to Garfield Park, and that's where uh, things happened. There was a big lake in the park where actually now the confluence of Pleasant Run and Bean Creek uh, come together. There was a large park. One side was for the men, the other side was for the ladies. So that's how things were at the turn of the 20th century in Garfield Park. 1902, the shelter was built. After at that point in time, uh, it had been condemned because of, of uh, disrepair from, from what the folks say, there was termites. So the city came back in, rebuilt it, and uh, then Kessler his work began throughout the park. Uh, the sunken gardens were completed and dedicated in 1916, and uh, many other changes happened through the park in that period of time. The, the growing gardens uh, and uh, greenhouses were built, and there was great activity. Uh, in 1920, interesting note, if you haven't had a chance, if you don't know Garfield Park that well, if you go to the north side, uh, the, more, the Memorial Grove was dedicated, and this was uh, in honor. There were 387 trees that were planted at that point in time in honor of every life that was lost in World War I. Many of those trees uh, still stand today. And you can also see where this was the last, there's a, there's a deck and stairs that come down from where the, where the trolley stop was at. So as we move into the 1920s, 
The amphitheater, the original amphitheater was dedicated in 1922. The shelter house was built, the original pool was built uh, and they closed up the lake. So it took about another 30 years. And then in the 19, mid 1950s, when Mayor Clark came on the scene, Alex Clark, uh, there was great uh, movement throughout the city, a lot of development, as we saw in the, the slides of how Indianapolis had grown in size. Uh, and there was a major level of investment during the period of time that the Clark administration was in City Hall. And interestingly enough, if you look at where that original that uh, original plan uh, from 1958, it would have gone smack dab through the middle of the conservatory. So um, we're glad for that, aren't we? So many other things happened, but roughly from the 50s until the 90s, the parks were, uh, all the amenities were there, but over a 30 year period of time, they fell into much disrepair. There was a lot of other things that were happening in the park at that time too, in terms of relationship to criminal activity. Uh, many folks would remember where the pagoda was. There was a road that actually came in and there was a parking lot to the south of where the art center is today. That was the old rec center. And um, in the early 1990s through the Building Better Neighborhoods program of, of the Goldsmith administration, there was much thought that went into uh, really rethinking how the flow of traffic and how we looked at Garfield Park, the level of interactivity. So many of the roads that were there, and as a matter of fact, um, most it, being somebody that grew up in the 70s and 80s in high school, we used to back in, in the early 80s, there used to be the old Southside Strip. And if any folks are watching might remember, it used to be out on, on uh, East Street on 31 in Madison. Uh, the uh, business owners ran ran all the kids off then. And then there was a period of time in the, in the 80s where it came through and there was this route that you would drive your car and you'd cruise through Garfield Park. So one of the things the community members, uh, they blocked off our road, they put flower pots up. There was, used to be a road where the Overlook is right now in uh, the park at the Sunken Gardens. There used to actually be a road that cut through there. So you could drive the loop and come down along. There was a road that ran up by the uh, amphitheater and you popped out uh, to the south side and came, you could come out southern. So long story short, they put the kibosh on that. Kids couldn't have that kind of fun. And um, when we came to the 1990s, we really started looking at uh, the, the effective flow and what you see in terms of the, the uh, in and out and the entrances and uh, the flow of the park changed dramatically. So in the 1990s, we then also saw the reinvestment uh, in lighting in new playgrounds in the aquatic center, uh, the old shelter house, which became the rec center. Obviously now we have on the Northwest side of the park, the Barillo Center. And then uh, through the course of the 1990s, there were numerous conversations about what do we do with the old rec center? And of course today, it is the wonderful Garfield Park Arts Center. So many, many things happened, but it's interesting enough to know that from the inspiration of the work that was done through Kessler and the fountains and the gardens and the bridges, uh, the seven historic bridges that are in the park, uh, we had this magnificent, uh, historic uh, park with wonderful amenities to it. And that leads us to the Friends of Garfield Park. I'm asked to talk a little bit about the history and then we'll talk right now, I'll segue, because it was in 1998 that a group of uh, community-minded folks in that in those times, I had uh, been a part of the first restoration of the amphitheater when it became the McAllister Center in 1997, when I was uh, in my position at the Indianapolis Parks Foundation. We raised at that time about $300,000 to do major overhaul of really creating the, the, the mounding and the uh, fencing around the existing amphitheater. Went at that time, up until the 1990s, there was no fence. There were old wooden benches. So we put new seats and benches and did some work inside the, uh, the uh, amphitheater itself. And uh, through a wonderful gift from P.E. McAllister, a local business owner and a great friend of Garfield Park. Uh, at that point in time, the lead gift, it was named the McAllister Center for Performing Arts in 1997. Uh, along through the 1990s with the Building Better Neighborhoods campaign, the Lilly Endowment had a significant level of investment, somewhere near $10 million. So there was a, a conversation in the community of saying, um, could we create a fund that could help support programs and maintenance in the park? And at that point in time, uh, the Parks Foundation looked at it and uh, it was agreed to that we would take it through an, a unique program called, at that point, it was called Partners in Parks, which paralleled a program that the endowment had seated called Partners in Education. And uh, so we looked at uh, what we could do at Garfield Park. There was a group of us. I left the foundation in 97, became a private citizen. And there was a group of us in the fall, November of 98, uh, that sat at the old Fireside South restaurant and formed the Friends of Garfield Park uh, nearly 22 years ago. 
Uh, from that time, we, we took on the mantle of raising the million dollars for a fund. We partnered with the Central Indiana Community Foundation. Um, actually, in those days, it was still the Indianapolis Foundation, but we worked with them. Uh, we got a challenge grant of $333,000, and in three years, uh, we raised the million dollars. Along that way, and from those dollars, so you know, okay, here's this money, what's it used for? Uh, since that time, over $200,000 has gone into the fountains and uh, the Friends of Garfield Park for almost 10 years now has provided the uh, preventative maintenance, actually the uh, ongoing maintenance of the, of the fountains throughout the season and then the opening and the closing. And capital uh, is still, uh, has been over the years, the responsibility of Indy Parks, but we do our part and have invested nearly 200,000. And from that also roughly $750,000 since 2006 in programmatic grants and supports. Uh, support uh, of programs. Um, in 2004, uh, we worked with Indy Parks to create a cultural landscape report uh, that really went in and documented the, the historical elements, all of the historical elements in the park. Now, this was critical to help be the really a forerunner uh, for Garfield Park being placed on the historic register. So the cultural landscape report, we looked at the trees, we looked at the historic elements, and uh, that report is online and uh, you, anyone can access it. We started looking at what are some of the major things as we were growing as an organization. Um, in 2005, we received a, a gift, uh, an anonymous gift from uh, an estate, and we had about $100,000. And at that point in time, one of the biggest parts to the park that had been removed in the 90s, there was a footbridge that was connecting the sunken gardens and uh, over the, the pathway over to the McAllister Center. Uh, so we went to the community and they said, if you could use these funds, let's build this bridge. And we built Friends Bridge in 2008. Um, 2014, kind of moving forward, uh, we launched an initiative, uh, Historic Engagement. We worked with Big Car and uh, with some other funders through the uh, Nina Mason Pulliam Trust uh, to create our Garfield Alive Historic Tour. Uh, if you've seen the, the, uh, the markers that go through uh, that, that look like an old uh, record player from the turn of the 20th century, an old gramophone. Uh, I won't go into too much, but you can go on site, go on our website, and you can learn more about this Garfield Alive tour. But it was also the beginning of what we have used, what the Friends have used since that period of time, a community engagement effort that looks at how do we bring Garfield Park to life? How do we attract more people into the park? Uh, not just neighbors, but create uh, the living historical story of Garfield Park. So we've had a lot of success there and uh, we'll host many, many walking tours, the path itself is about 1.2 miles. Um, in 2015, it was time. It had been nearly 20 years since the first enhancements of the uh, McAllister Center. We launched it in the latter part of 2015, launched a capital campaign and raised $400,000 to do the next phase of the McAllister Center, which put three lights in, rebuilt the dressing rooms in the back, uh, overhaul of, of painting, uh, new painting on the fences and the staging areas and rededicated uh, that work in the summer of 2017. Um, it should be of note that in the summer of 2016, we worked with Keep Indianapolis Beautiful uh, with a program for an initiative called Reforest Garfield. Uh, at that point in time, that in 2016 planted 250 trees, uh, had uh, a number of young students from uh, the University of Indianapolis that came out and worked with us and uh, a number of other partners. Uh, since that time, we planted well over another 250 trees to reforest uh, this great uh, public asset. Um, 2018, uh, and this is near and dear to my heart and I'll just be sensitive to our time. Um, we began an effort uh, to at the conservatory, and if you've not seen this, uh, just to the east of the conservatory, we back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, the friends along with uh, Indy Parks and the good work that Fritz Nerding was doing at the conservatory at that time, uh, we built uh, a children's garden, a growing garden and an interactive place, but it was pretty fundamental, but uh, we got a lot of use out of it. Um, Indy Park staff uh, came into the Friends of Garfield Park and some of us in the community and said, we'd like, we've like got this idea where we'd like to really do something special in the park uh, to update the children's garden. And uh, hence in 2019, July of 2019, what you see there uh, is this magnificent new uh, Blake's children guard, child, Children's Garden, which is named in honor of my late son, uh, Blake Bow, uh, who, um, battled brain cancer and lost his life back in 2017. Uh, but we've received, uh, the last year we were the Monumental Affairs People's Choice Award. We've won uh, several 
uh, Landscape Design Awards, we worked with uh, Jeff Mater, who is one of the board members of the Friends of Garfield Park. Uh, he did the design, Hegerman Construction, leveraged about $200,000 in investments for the park. So um, we are a 501c3. Um, we are governed by a board of 18 people. Linda Borello uh, is the president of the board. And of course, you know that name. Linda worked in, in the Garfield Park uh, community and Garfield Park for 50 years for Indy Parks. And she serves uh, as the president of the board. And we uh, have a tremendous board of community, uh, about eight or nine folks live in the neighborhood. And then we have other folks that uh, have some connected tie through life to Garfield Park. But uh, Garfield Park's a wonderful place. We're blessed to have it as a public asset. And uh, there's much, much history there. So I'd encourage you, if you want to learn more, uh, go to GarfieldParkIndy.org, GarfieldParkIndy.org, and you can uh, get plugged into Garfield Park. Thanks. Pleasure being here. And uh, there you have it. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Abby went ahead and put the friends link as well as um, the links. Uh, Jordan went ahead and put the links from her um, presentation as well um, for everybody. I'm going to move us all right along. Our next speaker is Michelle Salinas. As a lifelong Southside resident, Michelle is a proud, proud to advocate for her community as director of the South Indy Quality of Life Plan. She's a Gar the Garfield Park Farmers Market Board member and Garfield Park Neighbors an Engagement and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee member. She has lived in the Garfield Park neighborhood since 2006 and has been privileged to raise four children with Garfield Park as their front yard. Building a sense of community through neighborhood and youth serving nonprofit organizations is her passion. She has had a diverse background, which includes degrees and work in environmental design of urban planning, nonprofit management, and elementary education. So without further ado, I will pass this over to Michelle so she can share her experience. Thanks, Kavita. Um, good evening. As she said, my name is Michelle Straw Salinas, and I'm going to give you a brief talk that I am calling A Year in My Life as a Garfield Park Neighbor, the Best of Edition. So the year was 2006, and we were finally ready to move into our new home on East Garfield Drive with Garfield Park as an extension of our front yard. As we were coming in and out of the house, bringing in the last of our moving boxes, a neighbor walked over, introduced herself, and pointed back to her house four doors down where her daughters were doing sidewalk chalk art and asked if my eight-year-old daughter wanted to join them. That was the start of not only our 16-year friendship, but also the friendship of our oldest daughters, which we later learned were only two months apart in age. Sidewalk art is a bit of a tradition in Garfield Park and also with my four kids. As you walk the neighborhood sidewalks, you will find chalked joyful messages and sometimes interactive fitness paths. For years, we participated in the sidewalk art contest in Garfield Park. And the one year that I thought we had a chance to win, the rain came through and washed away all of our hopes of victory. Winters in Garfield Park are full of memories of sledding on the hills at the Art Center and the North Hill near Raymond Street. I remember one particular day when my oldest son joined some neighbors in building the best sled ramp ever. And he was out for hours. And I eventually had to go and demand he come home as it was getting dark. On cold Saturdays, we always had an art project to look forward to at the Art Center while visiting with our best art buddy, Sarah Norman. The walls, the walls and shelves of my home are full of our Arts for All masterpieces. Over the years, my kids and I developed great relationships with Garfield Park staff, as we fully participated in all the park had to offer, from tennis, t-ball, swim lessons, art classes, piano lessons, camps, nature walks, critter chats, library visits, exercise classes, bike rides, and my older kids worked as a lifeguard, camp counselor, and to this day, my oldest son works at the desk at the Borello Family Center. Spring in Garfield Park is full of anticipation as neighbors tend their flower beds and gardens. Walkers and joggers are out in force. We joke in Garfield Park that we recognize our neighbors more for their dogs than the people themselves, but it's very true. The only animal that outnumbers the dogs 
is the squirrels of Garfield Park. My best spring memory was the Easter that we hid candy-filled plastic eggs in the yard before we went to church so the kids could hunt for them as soon as we got back. However, to our utter disbelief, we came home to open eggs and discarded foil and plastic wrap all over the yard. In less than two hours, the squirrels had found the eggs and managed to eat all the candy. Of course, we had to run over to the family dollar, restock, and have a do-over. I have felt great animosity towards those squirrels ever since. Managing the squirrels is a big part of being a Garfield Park neighbor and the topic of many a neighborly discussion. To this day, I still sprinkle dried hot peppers in my garden so that they will stay out of my tomatoes and squash. Another much anticipated spring activity in Garfield Park is the Garfield Park Farmer's Market. The market just completed its fifth season in Garfield Park and it was bigger than ever with 35 vendors attending on some Saturdays. As many of you may know, I served as the market master for seasons two and three and have since served as a board member. The farmer's market not only brings locally sourced food and produce to our neighborhood, but I have witnessed firsthand how it gives us a place to come together and build relationships with our neighbors. My best summer memories are hosting and attending porch gatherings and the neighborhood block party. One of the great things about Garfield Park Homes is that we have great porches. Porching is something we all have in common and is a part of the social fabric of our neighborhood. I also appreciate the year I joined the neighborhood garden walk because I met so many neighbors on the south side of the park and have maintained those friendships ever since. Another fun summer activity is attending First Friday events in Garfield Park. Normal stops include the Garfield Park Art Center, the Tube Factory, Listen Here, Pen and Pink, Garfield Brewery, and occasionally the Jennifer Meeker Art Ceramic Studio. Having Garfield Park as my front yard has been great for raising four kids. We always have something to do. Fall in Garfield Park is always bittersweet in that the summer was so much fun and has now ended, but there are so many great fall activities as well. Four years ago, while I was a Garfield Park Neighborhood Association board member, I helped form the diversity committee and we created some great initiatives to welcome all our neighbors to our events. The event I am most proud of is the Dia de Muertos event that had to go virtual in this, its third year. This event always takes place on November 1st and its success far exceeded our expectations with over 700 attendees the first year. We have expanded our diversity efforts to focus on equity and inclusion. Like the yard signs we created that say, Garfield Park welcomes all, we want all of our neighbors to join together in building and celebrating our community. Garfield Park staff has been great partners in all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Another highlight of fall is the Autumn Arts Fair. We have many talented neighbors and community members who bring their art to display and sell at the Art Fair, which is held at Garfield Park Art Center. It is a great way to support local arts and an excuse to run into neighbors. So as you, as you have just heard, Garfield Park has much to offer. I encourage you to engage in park activities for the social and physical benefits that it can offer. Studies show that more socially engaged people live longer and happier lives. Our parks offer that outlet and so many of the activities are free. So if you are not engaged with the park and your neighbors, what are you waiting for? Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think it's always important to hear from folks who live um, in the, uh, the communities near our parks and uh, hear their perspective on how um, they utilize the park uh, as well. So um, I will go ahead and introduce our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is Don Colvin. Don joined the Indianapolis Park Department of Parks and Recreation in 1990 as a senior park planner and advanced in his role to a principal park planner, administrator of resource development, and since 2008, deputy director of parks. He currently reports to both the directors of public works and Indy Parks. 
Don leads the following divisions, park planning, a $5.6 million capital program, greenways, land stewardship, forestry, and park maintenance. Don holds degrees in forestry, horticulture, and a master's in landscape architecture. So I'll go ahead and pass it along to Don. Well, thank you, Kavita. I appreciate it. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Um, all right, come down here to the bottom. All right, is every, everybody can see that? Can everybody, can everybody see my screen? Hello? Yes, good, Don. Okay, well, welcome and thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I hopefully, my presentation, it's gonna be a lot of pretty pictures, but hopefully it'll tie in a lot of the great speakers that we had tonight in their conversations. We are a result, Indy Parks is a result of all those conversations. And today, we are serving many of the same people and the same issues that were prior to this. We're trying to address those today. We're not a small park system. We're 212 parks within Marion County, which is 400 square miles. We have over 11,254 acres. We serve over 8 million residents that come to our parks and our facilities. We offer 2,400 programs, over 129 playgrounds, 20 aquatic centers, 23 splash pads, and numerous hard courts in that. We, like many of the historic plans, depend and seek our vision from the community first and foremost when we develop our greenway plans and we do our five-year comprehensive park master plans. This sets the vision for the future. It helps us stay abreast of the trends, both in sports and rec and leisure and where the communities are changing. One of the more recent ones that just come out is the Riverside Park Master Plan. It was a great vision plan with tremendous amount of community engagement. And it was taking a look at the central part of Riverside proper, if you would, where Bretzel Parkway terminates next to the White River and the current family center is. But it also took into consideration the, the two golf, the three golf courses, Coffin on the west side of the White River, South Grove along down by uh, Kunt Soccer Stadium and 16th Street, as well as the Riverside Golf Course. And it, it revisioned both of those, those properties. In particular, the Riverside uh, Golf Course, we are now going through a site development plan um, to repurpose that 100 acres of golf land there. And what's surprising is many of the points that were earlier made about what folks would like to see in this community is the passive recreation component to basically go out and observe nature in, in its natural form. And they really enjoyed as we're doing our surveys and having our public input meetings and that, they really enjoyed this open space. And what was unique about this, talking about social equ equity and diversity, cultural diversity, and they were, many of these local residents have lived there all their life and has never, because they didn't play golf, had never been on this 100, 100 acres of land. So when we opened up the tours to come through this, to come through the old golf course, this was some of the first times that they'd ever experienced this space. And some of the other things I'd like to see is um, introducing art and cultural stories of the community at large, retain the old cop pass as either walking, biking, uh, trails, and then maintain a lot of the open spaces. Another visionary plan that we embarked upon is the Broad Ripple Park Master Plan, where we took uh, a complete look at the whole park. It's about 64 plus acres of land. And again, we do nothing without engaging the full community. It is their ideas, their vision. We are fortunate enough to be stewards of these assets and as a public uh, employee, but our job is to implement their vision and interpret their ideas. One of the exciting things has been one of the first ones we built on the north side is a new family center. This is a public a private partnership where th this is be embraced, embracing the river to be where the old public library used to be or the current family center that would be torn down and this new facility would be built. It would have a full-size gymnasium. It would have an up 
uh, so a second story, uh, full running track, walking track, had multi-purpose rooms. It would uh, be able to accommodate, accommodate aerobics, educational classes, um, numerous flex spaces, as well as having a health partner. As, as again, the mission of Indy Parks is healthy lifestyles and what better partner is to bring in a health uh, providing agency and, and marry those two services together. What has always been popular is aquatics in Indy Parks. And we have tried to keep up with the trends. No one wants to just come to a rectangle park anymore and just swim laps. They want big, huge slides. They've been to too many amusement parks, I think. But they want the big slides. They want the splash areas. They want, want the shade. We recently had the opportunity to upgrade one of our four indoor aquatic facilities in the island down on this, uh, near Raymond Middle School. Uh, we just did a brand new uh, slide and you can see the translucent panels in there so you can watch the, the guests ride down through the slide. It has sort of an aquarium uh, theme to it that's a, a big octopus. And also our uh, pools, we're introducing the water uh, playgrounds in the zero depth areas for the young children. Shade is very particular as we become more and more aware of uh, the sun and skin cancer opportunities. We are providing our guests with uh, abilities to get out of the heat of the sun and still enjoy the opportunities at our pools. We can't build a pool everywhere, although we have 23 of them. We uh, are now looking at uh, spray grounds or splash pads, and they also come in themes. We just completed the Arsenal Park splash pad, and that had a sports theme on it. And these are interactive uh, splash areas. Another major feature with our earlier splash pads used to take city water in and then just dis disperse the city water back into the sanitary drains. Our new splash pads are being water conscious and we're trying to also provide a, a more enjoyable experience. So we are now treating the water and recirculating it. And by doing that, we also can maintain the water pressure at these spray features. In fact, it's just so much fun watching the kids wait for the bucket to drop on the right hand slide here of your image and just get totally covered with all that water. We're able to do that because we are using our own recirculating pumps and maintaining our own pressure. We cannot be who we are without partnerships. Um, we have over 3,256 volunteers, um, 65 corporate community partners, Obviously, uh, our city budgets, although we're very fortunate to have it and we have a very supportive administration of parks and recreation, it, we just can't do it alone. And we depend so much on volunteers and partnerships. Just a, a happy day in the parks. You can see they come out, they do all types of work for us, tree plantings, mulching playgrounds, painting murals, uh, painting our picnic tables and our shelters, planting trees with KIB, who's another great partner when you, we, we talk about our green space, and even basic things of lining our parking lots. We also have some large corporate sponsors. Um, we wouldn't be the city that we are today without the Lilly Endowment, so I'll give them an overall shout out. They're, they're integrated into so many of these initiatives and through our friends groups. But the Citizen Energy Group has stepped up. And they, they are participating over at the Douglas uh, Golf Course. They renovated that. They're doing the bathhouse at Douglas and the Family Center. And in the past, they've done Brookside Family Center and Pride. The Indianapolis Power and Light Company has also stepped up in a big way and has adopted the Riverside Regional Park with a three-year partnership, improving the grounds each year, as well as coming inside the building and improving the lighting, changing the lighting over the LED, proposing this year to put in a, a new educational kitchen in there, as well as renovating a lot of the other interior spaces. We also have the Indianapolis Park Foundation, which is now the Indianapolis Park Alliance. And through their partnership with the PACES in the fever, they've been assisting us in, in helping us re-renovate, repave, resurface, color coat, and stripe, both interior and exterior basketball courts. We only have 132 of them, so we could use as much help as we can get. And then the whole trend in, in playgrounds is changing so much in the types of spaces that were developed. So this is a partnership, again, with the Indianapolis uh, Parks Foundation, Midtown, the, the Kennedy Center, where we're not only built 
a little community building, but we're offering cafe type facilities there. We had ice cream this past summer from Bricks. We have a water splash area. And we really have changed the dynamics of the playground. You can see the undulating mounds with a synthetic Sinlong type surfaces, artificial turf and the rubberized play areas. So they're universally accessible all times of the, of the year. We were fortunate to have the partnership of the Colts, the Colts Canal play space on downtown Canal. This is a one of a kind, uh, I call it all age playground. Um, you, depending on the time of the day, you'll see all different ages interacting with this particular play space. And again, these are universally accessible playgrounds. We don't discourage anybody from using them. The Colts again has stepped up in another way where they've all created these exercise or challenge courses and ninja courses. They have an art artificial turf basis and you run through this maze of different physical activity challenges and you end up in your timed. They also have some adult outdoor exercise equipment as, as part of that space. And, it, and again, as you've heard tonight with the Friends of Garfield Park and their support of the Sunken Gardens, the programs at Garfield, um, we have the Cultural Trail and the Pacers Bike Share Program that is providing opportunities along uh, multiple trails and the Cultural Trail that folks can just rent a bike and, and go to these different areas in their community. We have the investment from the Friends of Eagle Creek out at the west side, 2.6 million. We're building almost a seven mile trail that, um, that'll go from 56th Street all the way up to Wilson Road. And then you have the Friends of Holiday Park that has done numerous projects up there with the Nature Center, the renovation of the ruins, and they've just added the new uh, shelter slash uh, restroom near the playground up there. And then again, the Parks Foundation of Park Alliance uh, aligned with Indy Shakes through the, the generosity of the Lilly Endowment is bringing $9.2 million to restore the historic Taggart Memorial in Riverside Park. And, and the trends in playgrounds have changed tremendously from the very simple ones in the swing set but on the lawn to the requirements to have the appropriate surfaces if, if a child does fall off a piece of equipment and then the creative play for all different types of children. And, and this one particular one was another partnership where we're integrating ourselves a lot more with our different agencies. This is the Department of Metropolitan Development. We also work very closely with the Department of Public Works. And they were able to bring some dollars to the table in which we were able to take what used to be an old motorcycle gang uh, site on New York Street, and we turned it into Commons Park. Uh, through this investment. In this top right screen here, uh, this particular playground piece, it rotates in two ways. It rotates the whole unit as like an old fashioned wheel, and then those little in individual ones spin as well. And the children call that the vominator. Not recommended for adults. And then down at Sandorf Park, as you know, being in an urban area and some of the earlier maps, it indicated a lot of changes. Uh, in some of the redlined areas or also some of the brownfield areas. And one of our jobs is, we own some of these properties, is to repurpose those into a very positive use. And we had the benefit of just recently doing this down at Sandorf Park, right off of Raymond and State Street, where we had a, a brownfield type situation and we were able to remove all the contaminants and then come back in with, that is not natural turf, that, that particular product is Sin Lawn. It's a new playground surfacing. And that's the whole playground area is covered with that. We also covered underneath the trees with a rubberized surface so the children can play directly under the trees. The top left hand corner is the first multi use sports uh, court that we have in the city of Indianapolis or the state of Indiana. And on this particular court, you can play tennis, uh, basketball, futsal, pickleball. Now, for folks who don't know futsal, it's basically a more technical game of full-size field soccer, but you can bounce the balls off the walls very much like hockey, and you would shoot for a score. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, we were able to put in a pump track uh, for both skateboarders and bikes. And then on the other right, you can see it's no longer just a flat uh, playground structure with just a couple decks and you, you go down a slide. You can climb, you go under, you can go through. We've had musical components to our playgrounds and 
we connect everything now with walks because maybe there's a parent that has a, an impairment or a grandparent that has an impairment. And we wanna make sure that they can watch their grandchildren or their own children from all 360 degrees around these playgrounds. Again, looking at the, the way playgrounds have changed over the years, this is a shot of uh, Talkington Park showing the rubberized play surface, the mounding and the, the dynamics of that play in the multi-ages that it's able to serve. I couldn't leave this conversation without new trends in dog parks. We have four of them established, but we recently completed the renovation of Broad Ripple Dog Park, which was being loved to death. And that was one of the first initiatives out of the Broad Ripple Park Master Plan. We added the shade. So in the heat of the day, the, the guests can get out of the sun where the dogs run and have play. We put down a synthetic grass surface we also added a upper right corner or wash station so you can make sure your doggy goes home with clean paws before they get in your car. And also there's a doggy drinking fountain. I mentioned pickleball courts. So on our existing tennis courts, you just add a few more little stripes and you have the game of pickleball. It's become extremely popular for aging active adults. It's basically a upscale table tennis, downscale full-size tennis. So you don't have to run as much, but it's all the same rules and guidelines as tennis. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to leave this conversation without talking about greenways. During these troubling times of COVID, we were all kept inside. Greenways was the lifeline that brought us out into our parks and into our green spaces. And it provided a safe opportunity for people to de deprogram and relieve any stress that they may have had. There's an enormous amount of greenway work. I think we added over 50 miles of new trails. Uh, yeah, 50,000 50, linear feet of new trails um, in the system. These were all uh, worked on or completed this year. Uh, hopefully folks have gone over th by 38th Street and see the new Monon Bridge. Uh, so you no longer have to cross on 38th Street. You'll be able to fly over the top in a very safe manner. We, Fall Creek Trail was one of the first ones that we built in our system and it was an outcome of the George Kessel plan. And this one was recently renovated from 56th Street down to Allisonville Road. We basically took the trail mostly out of the floodplain up to higher and drier ground. So in the normal flood events, we, we still would be able to use these trails. As most people know, our trails are no longer just for recreation. Many people use these to uh, come to work and go home from work or to go shopping, to go to school. So they, they've taken on a whole new role and just instead of just pure leisure. Just another shot of the Fall Creek Trail renovation. This is dear to my heart, Pensy Trail. We worked on this since 2013, acquiring the land, but I'm proud to say we just opened up or it's gonna be open very shortly. The full seven miles starting at Ellenberger Park all the way out to German Church Park, tying into the Cumberland uh, Pensy Trail component. And just, uh, just a very quick shot. We have a tunnel that goes under 465 with um, is kind of a unique experience al along a trail. And then the last one, which is talking about areas that may have been redlined or forgotten, is the expansion of the, um, the canal towpath from 29th Street, right next to Riverside Park, all the way down to Birdsell Parkway. And then that will tie into some new extensions of the Fall Creek Trail over to Graham Edward Martin Park, the 16th Street, and IUPUI and the Cultural Trail. This should be the catalyst that changes that neighborhood. And this is, it, you know, it, this is making a difference when guests continually come out from around there as you're building the trail and just can't thank you enough. And, and just we're so excited that we did not forget them. And we're, we're putting an amenity in their community like this. And this is what we do. We, we try to make people happy. We, that's what we're all about and hopefully um, you've had an opportunity to experience one of our one of our great parks and you can't have a great city without a great city park system so at that point uh, thank you for letting me share my journey with you I want to stop sharing <laughs> thank you so much John Colvin um, I am going to give uh, folks a few seconds in case there are any Q and A's I think um, some of the links and stuff have been shared that were asked earlier by guests. Um, but I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their perspectives and expertise. 
um, we kind of curated this panel in a certain way because we wanted to show both um, a general history of parks, um, a history of Indianapolis and our urban environment, um, addressing some uh, issues of equity as well as getting experiences about friends groups, um, the future of indie parks, experiences from um, people who live and work and play in these parks. So just to kind of give you a full picture of what um, our city parks are like, how they will continue to evolve um, and hopefully you guys can get out and um, get a chance to uh, enjoy our parks and also check out our exhibition. Um, Abby's dropped the link in the uh, chat as well. So there's additional history um, as well as historical photos um, provided by the Historical Society and Indiana album. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions. I know we're over on time, so I'll just go ahead and wrap up. If anybody comes up with a question at a later date, feel free to contact us at the Art Center and we'll get you in touch with any of the speakers. Um, our email is gpacarts at indie.gov and Abby will also throw that in the chat. So thank you again to all of our panelists um, for sharing all the history, all their uh, knowledge on our neighborhoods, communities and the future of Indie Parks. And a special thank you to our partners at the Historical Society and Spirit in Place and the Friends of Garfield Park. So thanks for attending and we hope uh, everybody has a great evening and. A great weekend.